This is a story from the land of Nod. Hi, my name is Annie and I create everything that you see and hear here at Land of Nod. If you would like to support the work that I do, please consider going to patreon.com forward slash land of Nod learning. Thank you. Thomas the Rhymer Erkeldoon is a hamlet that lies in the shadow of the Aildon Hills. Here, in the old days, there lived a man called Thomas Learmont, who was no different from his neighbours, except for the fact that he loved to play upon his lute, as the wandering minstrels used to do. One summer's day, Thomas shut his cottage door behind him and set out with his lute under his arm to visit a crofter who dwelt on the hillside, thinking that the journey would not take him long if he stepped out with a good pace over the heather. But a brilliant sky shone overhead, and by the time he reached Huntley Bank at the foot of the Aildon Hills, he felt sufficiently sun-weary to rest himself in the leafy shade of a great tree. Before him lay a small wood, full of green cloistered pathways, and as he gazed into its cool depths, he plucked idly at his lute strings. He heard above his own music a distant sound like the trickle of a hillside stream. Then he started to his feet in amazement, for down one of those green pathways rode the fairest lady in all of the world. She wore a robe of grass-green silk and a mantle of grass-green velvet, and her bright hair hung loosely down upon her shoulders. Her milk-white horse moved gracefully through the trees and Thomas saw that on each tuft of its mane hung a tiny silver bell, whose twinkling he had mistaken for the trickle of a hillside stream. He pulled off his cap and fell down on one knee before the lovely rider, who reined in her milk-white horse and bade him rise. I am the Queen of Elfland. Come forth to visit thee, Thomas of Urkeldoon, she said. Then she smiled and held out a slim hand for him to help her dismount. He flung the horse's bridle over a thorn bush and led her to the shade of a great tree, caught fast in the spell of her pale, unearthly beauty. Play your lute to me, Thomas, she said. Fair music and green shade go well together. So Thomas took up his instrument again, and it seemed as though he had never before been able to play such lilting tunes. When he had finished, the elf queen showed him her pleasure. Let me reward you, Thomas, she urged him. Ask me some favour that I may grant you. Then Thomas, greatly daring, seized both her white hands in his. Let me kiss your lips, fair queen, he implored her. The queen did not draw away her hands, but smiled and said, If you kiss my lips, Thomas, then you must surely fall into my power. You will be bound to serve me for seven long years, through weal or woe as it may chance. What are seven years to me? replied Thomas. It is a penalty I would gladly pay. And he pressed his mouth to the elf queen's lips. Then the queen sprang up and Thomas knew that he was bound to follow her wherever she might lead him. Yet still the love enchantment was strong upon him and he did not regret his bold request, although it was to cost him seven years of his mortal life. She mounted her milk white steed and bade Thomas vault up behind her. And then, while the silver bridal bell sang sweetly, they sped on through green glades and over heathery slopes, travelling swifter than the four winds of heaven, until they reached a strange countryside, where the queen alighted and told Thomas they would rest for a little while. Thomas looked about him curiously, knowing it was no mortal ground on which they stood. A wilderness of curling bracken was behind them, trackless as the sea, but ahead three roads branched off from this barren landscape. One road, narrow and steep, was thickly flanked on either side by sharp thorn bushes and barbed briars that met overhead and made the pathway a dark tunnel. Another road was broad and fair and full of dancing sunlight, leading over a velvet lawn studded with clusters of jewel-like flowers. The third road wound onward through a ferny brake moss grown underfoot with a green canopy of foliage casting a cool shade overhead. The elf queen followed Thomas's gaze and told him where the three roads led. The steep and narrow road is called the path of righteousness, she said, and few travellers are bold enough to take their way along it. The fair, broad road that 
leads across the lawn is the path of wickedness, for all it seems so beautiful and full of light. And the bonny road that winds between the green hedgerow is the fair path to Elfland, where you and I shall be this very night. She went to her horse, who pawed the ground and tossed his head in eagerness to follow the ferny path. But before they rode on, she said to Thomas, If you obey my counsel and remember to keep silence whilst you are in Elfinland, in spite of all that you may hear and see, then at the end of seven years that you are bound to me, you will return to the land of men. But if you speak one word in my domain, you will forfeit your happiness and be doomed to wander forever the wilderness that lies between fair Elfinland and the world of men. They rode on along the third pathway, and Thomas found that there was still a great distance to traverse before they reached the Queen's domain. They journeyed over valleys and hills, across moor and plain. Sometimes the sky grew black as midnight, and sometimes the sun fringed all the clouds with gold. They forded rushing rivers that ran red with blood. When the sides of the milk-white steed were scarlet-splashed, and the Queen would kilt up her long green mantle, for all the blood that was ever shed upon the earth ran through the springs of that strange, strange land. But at last they reached the gates of Elfinland, where a thousand fairy trumpets proclaimed their approach, and they passed through into an enchanted country filled with a splendid light. And far away, in the land of the earthborn, the men of Urkeldoon whispered to one another the weird tale of Thomas Learmont, who disappeared one sunny summer's day. During all the time that Thomas remained in Elfinland, he spoke not one word in spite of all the wonderful things he saw and heard. And when he had served the Elf Queen for seven long years and the time was come for him to take his leave, she herself led him out of the fairy gates into a sunlit garden that lay without. Slender lilies and all fair flowers grew there and trees adorned with glowing greenness beneath which gentle unicorns stepped delicately. The queen stretched out a hand and plucked an apple from a tree, then held it out for Thomas to take. Now at last you may break your silence, Thomas, she said, and take this apple as a reward for the service you have rendered me these seven years. It is an enchanted fruit and will bestow on you a tongue that can never lie. Now Thomas was a quick-witted fellow, and he soon saw that being unable to speak anything but the truth for the rest of his life might be a doubtful blessing in the world to which he was returning. He tried to explain this to the Queen, saying, In the land of men, it is often necessary to exaggerate a little if a fair bargain is to be struck with a neighbour, and the favour of women must be won with eloquence. But the Queen only smiled and said, Hold your peace, Thomas, for my gift to you is not one to be lightly bestowed on any man. Greater than you can imagine, it will bring you lasting fame and cause the name of Thomas Learmont to be remembered as long as Scotland stands. Now you must return, Thomas, but first, heed my words. A time will come when I shall call you back to me and you must pledge yourself to obey my summons, wherever you may be. I shall send you two messengers, whom you will know at once are not of your world, but of mine. Thomas gazed into the black eyes of the elf queen, and he knew that the love spell she had cast upon him seven years since would never ever lose its power completely. Gladly he pledged himself to obey her command, and then a sudden drowsiness overcame him. The green garden with its gentle unicorns faded away, and a white mist like falling apple blossom descended from the sky. When Thomas awoke, he found himself lying in the leafy shade of the great tree that grew on Huntley Bank. He started to his feet in bewilderment and stared along the empty pathways of the wood, listening in vain for the music of the silver bridle bells. His seven-year sojourn in Elfland seemed no more than a summer afternoon's dream. He said aloud, One day I will return and then picked up his loot and took the way back to Urkeldoon, curious to know what had happened there in the space of seven years, and curious too about the gift the elf queen had laid upon his tongue. For I fear I may offend many a neighbour, he chuckled to himself, 
if I am indeed able to speak nothing other than the truth, they will get blunter answers and opinions than they bargain for when they ask my advice about themselves and their doings. As soon as he stepped into the street, a terrified yell went up from a poor old soul who imagined he had sauntered back from the very dead. Thomas soon proved himself to be very much alive, however, and before long the good people of Urkeldoon got over their surprise at his reappearance. But they never recovered from their surprise and awe when they heard Thomas's story of his stay in Elfinland. The children would climb on his knee and huddle round his feet, listening eagerly as he told them of the sweet enchantment of that fairy world. And the old folk would nod their heads and whisper among themselves of others who had been lured away by the elf queen. But one thing Thomas never spoke of was his pledge to return to Elfinland whenever he should be called by two fairy messengers. For his own part, Thomas was very surprised to find that it did not make much difference whether he was away from Urkeldoon for seven days or seven years. True, his cottage was in need of some repair, where the wind had dislodged a few stones in the walls and the rain had beaten in the thatch on the roof. And true, his neighbour showed a few more wrinkles and one or two more white hairs. But on the whole, through seven springtimes, summers, harvestings and winter blizzards, everything was much the same. Each day after his return, he waited to discover how the elf queen's gift would be fulfilled. He found, to his relief, that he was, after all, still able to speak fair words to the crofter's daughter and that he could yet persuade a doubtful neighbour to buy a cow or sheep. Then, one day, at a gathering of the villagers, when they were discussing the ravages of a mysterious cattle illness that had befallen the land, Thomas found himself compelled by some mysterious force to get to his feet. Words seemed to fall from his tongue of their own accord, and to his amazement he found himself prophesying that the illness would not touch a single beast belonging to the neighbourhood of Urkeldoon. The villagers were awed by this inspired bearing, and in some strange way, they knew beyond a doubt that he spoke the truth. They knew it even before the illness passed by without harming any of their cattle. After this, Thomas began to make many prophecies, most of them in rhymes that were easily remembered and were quoted from mouth to mouth. Again and again, they were proved right and his fame spread throughout Scotland, many rich lords and earls rewarding him for his sayings and marvelling at his uncanny power. But, although he visited many parts of the country and met many fine folk, Thomas did not desert Urkeldoon. With his newfound wealth, he built a fine tower to live in and dwelt there for many years. And yet, for all his fame and wealth, men remarked that Thomas was not an entirely happy man. There was always a strange light of longing in his eyes, as though he could not rid himself of the memory of an unearthly world. Every year, Thomas held a great banquet in his Tower of Urkeldoon, to which all the villagers and folk who lived nearby were invited. It was a night of festivity, when the pipers set feet a-dancing and hearts stirring, and the hall was filled with shouts of revelry. A great feast was provided, with a never-ending supply of ale, and when the dancers rested, and while the ale stoops were filled once more, Thomas would play his lute. It was during one such night, when the feasting and gaiety were at their height, that a servant came running into the rush-lit hall with a strange tale on his lips. There was such an urgency in his bearing that Thomas rose up in his place and called for silence, so that the servant might make himself heard. The laughter and shouting died away, and in the sudden quiet the man said, Oh master, I have seen the strangest sight in all the world, a milk-white heart and a milk-white hind from the forest beyond the hillside are walking down the street outside. Strange news indeed, for no beast that dwelt in the forest beyond the hillside ever ventured beyond those trees. Besides, who ever had heard of a milk-white stag and a milk-white deer? The guests, with Thomas at their head, rushed into the street, exclaiming at the sight before them. And sure enough, stepping slowly towards them in the moonlight, undisturbed by the great crowd of people that had suddenly appeared, came the two graceful deer. And Thomas knew them to be no earthly creatures, but two fairy messengers sent by the elf queen to recall him to her service. Joy and happiness overcame him at last as he left the throng and walked slowly away. 
Then, with the milk-white heart on his right and the milk-white hind on his left, Thomas Learmond passed up the village street and went off towards the dark forest, leaving Urkeldoom behind forever. But, as the elf queen had foretold, Thomas's great gift of prophecy brought him lasting fame, and today you will still hear men quote his sayings and repeat his rhymes. He delivered what was perhaps his most famous prediction in March 1285, when Alexander III, one of Scotland's wisest and greatest kings, was on the throne. On this day, the Earl of March sent for Thomas the Rhymer and demanded to know what the next day's weather would be. On the morrow, afore the noon, shall blow the greatest wind that ever was heard before in Scotland, Thomas told him. Late in the morning, the Earl sent for Thomas again. Where is this dire wind you spoke of? He rebuked him, indicating the day's mild weather. Noon is not gone yet, Thomas replied quietly. Just then a man burst into the Earl's presence, shouting that the king was dead. He had fallen from his horse on a steep cliff path and had been killed instantly. Yon is the wind that shall blow to the great calamity and trouble of Scotland, said Thomas. And indeed, when the dreadful news was known abroad, universal sorrow for the death of this good king was felt throughout the country and many, many years of unrest followed. Thomas also prophesied, As long as the thorn tree stands, Urkeldoon shall keep its lands. In the year that the thorn tree did fall, all the merchants of Urkeldoom became bankrupt and shortly afterwards the last fragment of his common land was lost. And this final prophecy may yet have to be fulfilled. When the cows of Gowry come to land, the judgment day is near at hand. The cows of Gowry are two boulders now lying beyond high water mark of Ivor Gowry on the Firth of Tay. They are said to approach the land at the rate of an inch a year. We shall wait and see if Thomas the Rhymer's final prophecy is set to come true. The End